CNN interview with Paul Ruza Sabagina, unveiling layers of heroism, politics, and human rights. As I always have said, and I repeat it again today, Rwanda is a volcano. Paul, in a letter after your sentence was uh, commuted, you wrote to the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, uh, expressing regret for any connection to violent actions by the FLN. You said, I extend my heartfelt sorrow for any pain FLN's actions have caused to victims and their families. And they said that they accept this and that you have agreed to stay out of politics. That time I was in hell. I was in hell, I was being tortured. I was being beaten. I was in a solitary confinement for almost 10 months. Between, between August 27th, 2020, until, and until June 12th, 2021, I was in hell. Once you are in hell, what can you say? You can say anything. I want to ask you this. You said the killings have never stopped, and yet the Tutsi Hutu killings have stopped inside. Do you think that's permanent? Is reconciliation real? Killings have never stopped in Rwanda, inside the country, because as we are talking right now, you've got hundreds of thousands of Rwandans. The prison where I was, we were about, about 18,500 people, meaning 2,500 women and 16,000 men. Therefore, I'm telling you that Rwanda in Rwanda, people are being frustrated. Those prisoners are eating just being fed one meal a day, every day at 11 a.m. And it is just beans and corn. Can you imagine living that kind of life for a year, two years? Some of prisoners have lived that kind of life for the last 30 years. Today we have two Rwandas. We have the Kagame Rwanda, the today's president of Rwanda, which is the capital city of Kigali, with him and his, his selected people. And you have the rural area, which is completely another Rwanda, miserable, where people are dying of hunger. And one other thing, I mean, I don't know how much you want to talk about Kagame, but you, you said Rwanda is a volcano. Welcome to Africa Flashes. In this segment, we present Paul Rusisabagina's recent interview with CNN by journalist Christian Amanpour. In it, he addresses a series of pressing questions. I want to highlight three critical observations before summarizing the main points of Rusisabagina's interview. The tone and narrative employed by journalist Christian Amanpour are disagreeable. Rusa Sabagina provided insight into his decision to sign the letter addressed to Kagame. I was displeased by CNN and Amanpour's apparent disregard for the significance of Rusa Sabagina's kidnapping by Kagame. The comments and inquiries posed by Amanpour during this interview vividly highlight the perpetuation of the narrative espoused by Kagame and his supporters regarding the genocide and their ongoing harassment of Hutus. However, a silver lining emerges from Rusa Sabagina's abduction as it has shed light on several truths about Kagame's regime. We anticipate this exposure will shift the narrative presented by CNN and other media outlets, urging them to adopt a narrative rooted in truth rather than falsehoods. Paul Rusisabagin confirmed what many of us had already guessed when Kagame's regime made his letter demanding pardon public. It's no longer a secret that Rusisabagina was tortured and forced to sign the letter, which is the reason he has been talking to the media or participating in political events and other events that Kagame's regime hoped that he would stop participating in. Paul Rusesa Bagina's recent confirmation sheds light on a matter many had suspected since Kagame's regime publicized his letter requesting a pardon. It is now apparent that Rusesa Bagina was subjected to torture and coercion, leading to his signing of the letter. 
This revelation explains his subsequent engagement with the media and participation in political and other events, which Kagame's regime likely hoped he would cease. I'm disappointed that CNN didn't address Kagame's responsibility for the kidnapping of Rusesa Bagina, which constitutes a terrorist act. Western nations would have responded differently if this had been committed by someone else or another country. Christiane Amanpour should have mentioned the kidnapping when discussing the fabricated charges Kagame used to imprison Rusesa Bagina during her CNN segment. Furthermore, Rusesa Bagina missed an opportunity to remind Amanpour about this terrorist act committed by Kagame. This example could have highlighted how the West continues to support Kagame despite his numerous crimes in Rwanda and beyond, such as in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he has caused harm to over 12 million innocent civilians. The CNN interview with Paul Rusesabagina offers a profound exploration of his heroic actions during the Rwandan genocide, his subsequent involvement in politics, imprisonment, and critique of the Rwandan government under President Kagame. Rusesa Bagina's journey from being celebrated as a hero to facing charges of terrorism and imprisonment unveils complex layers of personal sacrifice, political turmoil, and human rights concerns. This critical review aims to dissect key themes and perspectives presented in the interview while examining the broader implications for Rwanda's political landscape and international relations. Rusesa Bagina's portrayal of his actions during the genocide at the Hotel Milkolin reflects immense courage and humanity, sheltering over a thousand refugees without discrimination based on ethnicity underscores his commitment to saving lives amidst unimaginable horror, his refusal to differentiate between Hutus and Tutsis, focusing instead on their shared humanity, encapsulates a powerful message of resilience and compassion in the face of mass atrocities. The interview draws attention to the dangerous consequences of dehumanizing rhetoric, as exemplified by Rusa Sabagina's discussion of the radio broadcasts during the genocide. The parallels drawn between historical events in Rwanda and contemporary political discourse, particularly concerning Donald Trump's language towards migrants and political opponents, serve as a stark warning against the normalization of hate speech and its potential to incite violence. Rusa Sabagina's transition from a celebrated figure to a political dissenter and subsequent imprisonment raises critical questions about freedom of expression and political dissent in Rwanda. His assertion that he joined politics to amplify the voices of the voice less highlights his commitment to advocacy and human rights. However, his arrest, trial, and imprisonment on terrorism related charges cast a shadow over Rwanda's democratic credentials, with allegations of a show trial echoing concerns raised by international observers. The interview highlights the ongoing reconciliation and national unity challenges in post-genocide Rwanda. Rusi Sabagina's depiction of the country as a volcano simmering with ethnic tensions underscores the fragility of peace and the unresolved grievances that persist decades after the genocide. The role of external powers, including the United States, in supporting Rwanda's government raises ethical dilemmas regarding geopolitical interests versus human rights considerations. The CNN interview with Paul Rusa Sabagina provides a poignant narrative of heroism, political persecution, and human rights struggles in Rwanda. Through his reflections, Rusa Sabagina challenges us to confront the complexities of history, politics, and reconciliation in post-genocide societies. As Rwanda continues its journey toward healing and democracy, the international community faces a moral imperative to uphold human rights and support genuine efforts for peace, justice, and national unity. Like that of Paul Rusesa Bwanda. Now, amidst the worst of humanity in Rwanda, there were also, of course, stories of hope, heroism, and resistance. Like that of Paul Rusesa Bagina, who managed to save more than a thousand lives by sheltering refugees who were trying to flee the violence. His story 
was of course immortalized in the film Hotel Rwanda. He was running a hotel that he used as a shelter. Since then, his life has taken some turns. He was found guilty on terrorism-related charges in 2021. A verdict the Clooney Foundation for Justice called a, quote, show trial. But he was released from prison last year after his sentence was commuted by the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, who Rusesa Bagina has heavily criticized. I asked him to reflect on such dark times when he joined me for this conversation from Texas, where he now lives. Paul Rusesa Bagina, welcome to the program. You became a hero obviously with the film Hotel Rwanda, but to those who you saved in the Hotel Mil Colline, can you remind us what you did 30 years ago during the genocide? In 1994, I was the general manager of the Mil Colline Hotel, and since April 6, 1994, we started having refugees, about 1,268 people happened to be served in the Mikolin Hotel where I was a general manager. None of them was taken out, none of them was killed, none of them was beaten. From the beginning to the end, everybody was safe. How did you do it? How did you know whether they were Hutus, Tutsis, who was there? I did not need to know whether they were Hutus or Tutsis. The most important part of it for me was to know that they were human beings. I helped human beings. I did not help Hutus or Tutsis. You know, I remember coming to cover it in 1994, and I also stayed at the Hotel Mil Colline slightly after the incident that you're talking about. But you remember the radio Mil Colline as well, who were agitating and really turning the, 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 the genocidaire against people? Well, I was also hearing the radio, but I also, but, um, I also kept, I kept uh, uh, negotiating with those who were the militias, trying to save lives. That was my mission. The radio, I did not care that much, of course. The radios, everything, everybody went mad. When you heard the radio calling Tutsis cockroaches and urging them to be killed, your wife was a Tutsi. What went through your mind? Well, that was very clear. It was dehumanizing people before killing them. That was a kind of a, a kind of way of way of dehumanizing them, so that killing them would not be killing human beings, but uh, just insects. Cockroaches. So I want to ask you a question about America. When you hear political language today, 30 years after the Rwanda genocide, Donald Trump calls migrants animals, less than human. He even calls his political opponents vermin, insects, animals. How do you think about that? Well, in Rwanda, killing that time in 1994, Trying to kill people as people, it was not easy. Nobody would have followed them. But a dehumanizing human beings, calling them animals, that was a way of humiliating them, putting them on the ground so that killing them would be not killing human beings, but killing insects. So therefore, whoever wants to to play a game, the first of all, of, uh, of doing something wrong, something bad, like killing, dehumanizes, first of all, the victims before killing them. That is what happens. And this is what happened in Rwanda in 1994. After Hotel Rwanda, the film, and after your, you know, heroism during that time, you joined politics. And for that, you were arrested, you were tried, you were imprisoned, etc. Eventually, your sentence was commuted, you did not get a pardon, and the government said it is important to note that there is consensus that crimes were committed by Rusesa Sabagina, that's you, and the militia, for which they were convicted. And under Rwandan law, 
commutation does not extinguish the underlying conviction. You expressed regret for your actions with a political group that apparently led to nine killings. Tell me about that, and are you still regretful? I do not regret any, anything. I was, well, of course, I joined politics because I tried to find a way of being the voice for the voicelesses through politics, through humanitarian acts, actions, be talking for those who could not talk for themselves. Paul, in a letter after your sentence was uh, commuted, you wrote to the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, uh, expressing regret for any connection to violent actions by the FLN. You said, I extend my heartfelt sorrow for any pain FLN's actions have caused to victims and their families. And they said that they accept this and that you have agreed to stay out of politics. That time I was in hell. I was in hell. I was being tortured. I was being beaten. I was in a solitary confinement for almost 10 months. Between, between August 27th, 2020, until, Ju and until June 12th, 2021, I was in hell. Once you are in hell, what can you say? You can say anything. So will you stay out of politics? In the letter you said you will spend the remainder of your days in the United States in quiet reflection. And then you said they expected me to be silent, to be the good guy and behave. No one can silence me that easily. So what are you saying? No one still, my word did not change as such. My message is very simple. No one can silence me that much. Humiliate me. Rwanda is supposed to be a democratic country. How can a democratic country silence citizens? Mm -hmm. Paul, as you know, since Paul Kagame has been in office, there are many complaints, there are also many successes. The economy, the environment, you know, gender equality, all sorts of things. But I want to ask you this. You said the killings have never stopped. And yet, the Tutsi Hutu killings have stopped inside. Do you think that's permanent? Is reconciliation real? Killings have never stopped in Rwanda inside the country because as we are talking right now you've got hundreds of thousands of Rwandans the prison where I was we were about about 18,500 people meaning 2,500 women and 16,000 men therefore I'm telling you that Rwanda in Rwanda People are being frustrated. Those prisoners are eating, just being fed one meal a day, every day at 11 a.m. And it is just beans and corn. Can you imagine living that kind of life for a year, two years? Some of prisoners have lived that kind of life for the last 30 years years. Today we have two Rwandas. We have the Kagame Rwanda, the today's president Rwanda, which is the capital city of Kigali, with him and his, his selected people. And you have the rural area, which is completely another Rwanda. Miserable, where people are dying of hunger. But do you think that all the trials, all the neighborhood trials, all the uh, war crimes trials, and Kagame's leadership, has it brought real reconciliation between the ethnic groups? Or, if he goes, will it explode in our, again? And, as I always have said, and I repeat it again today, Rwanda is a volcano. A volcano where people hate each other where people are completely separate, which that volcano can erupt any time. What do you think, Paul, the West should do? You remember they did not intervene to stop the genocide. You, your release was helped along by the United States, and you are in the United States. What do you think 
the United States and external powers should, could do. When I was a, a child growing up, we would always meet once a year, and that was the New Year's Eve. And that time, my dad would always give us a lesson at the end of our stay home. He would tell us that my, my sons, my children, if you happen to see two brothers fighting, you and you are called upon to come and separate them, you come, stand in the middle, and do never look to your left hand side because that eye on your left hand side is trying to corrupt your decision, your message. Do never look at your right hand side because the eye also on your right hand side is also trying to corrupt your decision. Look up and say the truth. So what Rwanda, Rwandans need from the international community, from the whole world, is not to stand on the Hutu side or the Tutsi side, but to stand in the middle and tell today's president, President Kagame, or whoever we follow him, to stand in the middle and say the truth. And so far, the truth has never been said. Nobody has been neutral. No country in the world has been neutral in trying to solve, to help Rwanda to solve its problems. It's and everyone is always bending on one side or the other. And one other thing, I mean, I don't know how much you want to talk about Kagame, but you, you said R Rwanda is a volcano. Kagame claims and his western backers claim that he keeps the com the volcano calm what do you say is he keeping it calm or is he stirring the volcano you know in 1994 the april 6th i never expected what happened to happen i never never thought nobody thought that abiyarimana would be would die the way he died we were surprised. I think that if we happen to be surprised and see what happened to Abiyarimana happening to Kagame, then we will see worse than what we went through in 1994. Well, there you are, and that's what he says. And for you, did Hotel Rwanda and the fame that came with it, and what you did at the be well, obviously what you did will always be worth it because you saved those many lives, but the fame, has it been beneficial for you or a negative? Well, it has been um, maybe 150% beneficial for me because would I have been not known by the world, then um, today I wouldn't be here. You will maybe know, you will notice, if you even do some research, if the world does some researches, you will know that all the people who happened to be kidnapped the way I was kidnapped, tortured, all of them except me, I am an exception, who was kidnapped, taken to Rwanda, and happened, surprisingly, to get out of Rwanda in two, after two years and seven months, which is almost nothing, and who has not who was not killed in prison. Paul Rusesa Bagina. And this is because mm -hmm. of Hotel Rwanda. Paul Rusesa Bagina, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you are the most welcome. Thank you.